All right, can you see that uh, uh, that presentation? Yes. Perfect. All right. Well, uh, we will begin then. So we are the auto pinball team. We created a self-playing pinball machine. Uh, my name is Tyler Gregg, and I am I work mostly on the software stuff. I'm Kevin Camperman. I did a lot of the mechanical design and integration. Introduce yourself, Cody. Oh, sorry. My name is Cody Myers, and I did a lot of stuff on the electrical. My name is Omar, and I was working on the electrical. All right, I'm going to hand it off to Kevin for our project scope. Excellent. Thank you, Tyler. All right, so we have created a custom-made pinball machine, and what really makes this unique is that this particular pinball machine can play itself in both manual and autonomous mode. It achieves this through a web camera through machine vision, and we have also integrated custom-made electronics to power the entire system. So we really look forward to presenting this for you today, and we're gonna get right into our mechanical design here. So as you can see, here are some SolidWorks renderings of our uh, mechanical design. You can see here we have a full play field with a complete stand with the electronics housed underneath. Here's a top view on the left-hand side of the playfield. You can see how all the boundaries and LEDs and uh, solenoids are all mounted to the playfield from the bottom. And here on the left, uh, on the right-hand side, you can see we've actually integrated a Plinko machine on the back of the uh, machine for multi-ball functionality. So I'm going to hand it off to Cody to talk about some of the electronics. Yeah, for the electrical section, uh, on your left here, you have this is the main control board for all the system. Right here is an Arduino Mega uh, 2560, the solenoid boards that control all the solenoids in the system, and the control boards for the LEDs. On your right is an upper view of the control board for the solenoids. This controls the flippers, uh, the slingshots, and all three bumpers. I'm give it off to Omar. Uh, on the right, on the left side, we can see the assembly of all of the electronics. And on the right side, you can see a picture where we test all electronics. All right, so here is our minimum success criteria. Um, I'll just summarize it really quickly. So the first point is that there will be two distinct modes that we can enter into, the manual mode and the autonomous hands-off control mode. Secondly, uh, basically the ball needs to, or the, the machine needs to be able to play uh, out of one of three balls consecutively hit the ball five times. So without dropping it down the center on one of those three balls, hit it into the play field and hit some component. And then the last uh, part of our minimum success criteria is to promote STEM education. We are imports and some uh, viewing stuff for the computer vision to sort of show off all the integrated parts of all of the Megatronic system. So without further ado, we are gonna move over to a video presentation or a more a live demonstration of our, of our machine so cody is going to stop sharing his screen real quick all right is that viewable oh i don't think they yep. can hear me I'm, oh can I'm, you hear me i see it i can hear you see it perfect awesome Sweet. So what we've got here is the entire play field uh, just as a big uh, consecutive bit. I will move around. You can actually see that there is uh, black and yellow acrylic across the whole play field. It's really cool. It's all nice and laser cut itself. And all the lights are turning back and forth. It's sort of in an attraction mode right now. So I'll back up his hair and show you the front. This is a beautifully laser engraved uh, logo that Kevin did for us. It was amazing. Um, on here, you can see that there is the start button and the autonomous. So you flip back and forth, changes between autonomous and manual mode, which we'll show in a bit, and the plunger. And then over here, we can take a peek inside of our little windows and take a look at some of the electronics underneath there. That's the boards that I showed you earlier before. And then we'll move around to the back side real quick so you can get a better view of those as well. 
And additionally, you can see that there are uh, right in there, those same stacked boards that, that Cody said, along with some, if you ask my opinion, beautiful wiring uh, management going on there. Uh, we also have the uh, multi-ball section right here where multiple balls are loaded into this feeder and then get dropped into this Plinko machine that we can see from the front side, which is really cool. And additionally, we have this uh, variable play pitch elevation. So it goes all the way from zero up to eight degrees. Currently, I believe it's on uh, six degrees. All right, um, without further ado, I'm going to show you a bit of the manual mode going on. So I'm gonna hand this over to Omar. All right, here we go. So the ball on is nice and smooth. Oh, and I immediately go straight down the drain. Shows you my pinball skills. Try it again. I hope your automated system is better than that. Flip it nice and fun. And each one of the, uh, the lights also turns on as you hit the components that they are attached to, which is really cool. So you can sort of get feedback from the player that is able to see when they hit different components and when they're going to get score increases and all that jazz. Um, and I'm going to see if I can activate the multi-ball mode. It goes all the way around, which is kind of fun. Oh, so close. If you get it up on that right ramp, then multi-ball play actuates. Let's see if I can do it. You ready? Not quite. All right, we'll give it one more. One more go. I'm going to cheat. You ready? Here we go. Oh, not quite. There it is. All right, come on. And then the multi-ball drops in. Oh, they both got stuck. Give it a little shake. Shake, shake, there it is. Oh, dangerous to try to manage all of these different balls coming down. And there it is. All right, we'll let the uh, we'll let the machine take over and see how it does. So. Uh, Really quickly. Hello? All yep. right. Is that viewable? Yep. Yeah, it looks good. All right. Well, then I will uh, launch the ball and we'll see how it goes. You might also be able to see uh, behind the screen over here. This is what the uh, the camera can see like, from the computer vision portion. So there's a little flipper zone that if the ball enters into that area, then it will start to flip. So we'll see how it do, does. Oh, there's the first one. All right, next ball. Oh, so close, almost a rookie ball. Oh, oh. Goes. come on, give me a rookie ball. There it is. Let's see how it handles itself. Oh, two straight down the drain. <laughs> so sad. All right. Well, I am going to move us back over here, and I've got a headphone in, so that way I can hear any questions that you guys have. Um, but I think we'll have everybody in the front now. And and we'll uh, answer any questions that you guys have. Yeah, very nice. Um, really cool. Um, out of curiosity, you know, what sort of uh, 
what sort of approach did you use on the machine learning? How'd you, how'd you end up with that? Did you just do some sort of color thresholding or, you know, what was the approach on the machine vision? Excellent question. Um, can you step to the side of here? So what I ended up doing, I wasn't able to fully implement any sort of machine learning stuff, unfortunately, um, sort of part of the COVID constraint pushed into with lack of time and other things. Um, so let me see if I can make that quite high enough. Let me drag it up a little bit on the screen. See if I can see that. So there's actually a sort of uh, flip tone represented. I'll be able to see it with it so far away. Uh, but the two flippers get identified automatically by the uh, camera, and that periodically resets also in case anything gets taken out of place or whatever, so that we constantly know what that happens. And that's doing it by uh, HSP color thresholding. And so um, it sort of identifies where the flippers are and is able to automatically place a flipping area at uh, where the flipper rotates. At the extent of the flipper range is a circular radial uh, zone. And so then there's a couple of tweaking parameters that we can tune to make it on the exact spot that we want it to be for general ideas. But basically, the uh, balls identified inside of the flip zone, then I tell it to flip. Um, like I said, unfortunately, I wasn't able to implement any sort of velocity control or other stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, that's how that works. Very cool. Uh just a, a, a side note. It's funny. I do love your uh, the uh, the logo and everything. What's funny though is unfortunately that that the mountain that mountain logo is actually no longer used. So uh, yeah, literally like this semester got <laughs> got taken away. Yeah. That being said, uh, I'm able to see really quickly. We do have the new logo additionally. Yeah, right. On, there you go. Yeah, on the top. Does anybody speak up? <laughs> a couple people in their chat are wondering what it'll take to get one of these in their basement. Well, um, it'll take a whole nother semester of senior design <laughs> work broken into it. No, it's actually, um, now that the design process has been done, I've left us sideways, I apologize. But yeah, like I said, now that the design process has been completed, it's actually not that much more work to get everything integrated. So. Yeah. All of the wood that you see here was CNC'd in the architecture of the building. So, but but the significant amount of work went into Kevin designing that. If you want to talk a hair about that. Yes. So uh, for many weeks we had a uh, pretty intense uh, design uh, of this playfield and the stand. Uh, we were very fortunate. Uh, we'd, we'd like to thank the architecture uh, department for uh, really lending a hand in getting this CNC'd and this beautiful wood, also donated by um, a local supplier. Um, so we are very thankful for everything that we were able to achieve given the COVID constraints uh, that everybody's been facing. Um, and we are quite proud of it. And um, additionally, uh, Cody has, Cody No More have all the boards modeled yeah. out as well. And so unfortunately they're not uh, PCBs this time, but that was an, ex an option we looked into, but we're due to COVID reasons, we're unable to get those manufactured. Yeah, uh, the copper was actually from China. The copper has been kind of constricted and everything because all these other companies buying extra supplies and stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the way that we were going to do a PCB, we were going to just take a piece of copper, uh, copper straight with fiberglass in the middle, and using a milling machine, we were going to actually mill out our traces to produce the PCB. But we couldn't get our hands on the copper. We had the machine ready, but the, the copper substrate was much harder to obtain. So cost-wise, it was about a grand in terms of uh, parts that we bought. But you know, if we're going to sell it to you. We'll give you a nice hefty, uh, hefty up mark on that one. So. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? Well, yeah, I want to echo the a lot of comments uh, in the chat window and just say that y'all put together a really great product from bottom to the top. And I'm happy to see everything come together the way it did. I'm I have a question for each of you. What's what's um, maybe the most rewarding thing in in this project that you had? Oh man, I guess I'll start. Um, the most rewarding part for me, uh, I've been a huge pinball nerd from my childhood. Um, literally, like playing Pokemon pinball on my Game Boy Advance, stuff like that. Um, and for for forever, ever since I've started becoming an engineer, uh, it's been a it's been a goal of mine to build a machine 
like this. Um, so just like literally seeing it, a, a, a quite little childhood dream come true uh, has been by far the most rewarding part. Uh, and, you know, getting to do with these guys is also really cool. Uh, for me, also, you know, uh, meeting new people, that's amazing, uh, especially because I'm by myself here this day. So <laughs> how you fun with these guys is that was most We're important. important. <laughs> Um, yeah, I honestly, it was the challenge involved. Uh, there was a lot of, I went through quite a few boards, I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> um, but I ended up, it ended up making a new challenge and I ended up learning quite a bit. Like, for instance, this entire pinball machine, the electronics are actually modular. So there are actually only five connectors. You only had to unplug five connectors from this machine to actually disassemble the entire electronics. Yeah, to take the whole play field yeah. out, which is really cool. Uh, I made it idiot proof, so I can't <laughs> I can't plug anything backwards. So um, it was just learning the process of actually making a production unit. And I know we're out of time, so I'm gonna go really fast. Uh, for me, it was being able to see the project through all the way from the conceptual design stage all the way uh, to building a physical product like this. And like I said, working with these amazing people here. Great, thanks for sharing. Uh, we do have a, a question from the chat. Uh, someone's asking if the autonomous flipper control does anything to aim or vary to shoot at different particular points, or was it mostly just trying to hit it at all? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I see Charlie did that, so shout out to my boy Charlie. Ah, Charlie. <laughs> <I know. laughs> um, uh, so there was a few things I tried to implement. Um, currently, the, the code that's running on there right now is has a very wide flipper area that it hits. Um, what I, I've tested a couple different configurations, and what I found that kept the ball alive the longest, which is what I was shooting for, is this configuration. Um, my tuning of other parameters, I could tune it to hit specific shots more often than others. So for example, the, um, the multi-ball play is a really cool part that you'd like to see more often. And so I was able to tune the flipper area to more often hit that shot. That being said, um, you sort of have to load up one of these configurations before you start it up. So it's not it's not something that I can on the fly tell it to change currently. Obviously, that would be something I would be really interested in doing in the future time. Thank you. The problem is us building this and stuff in COVID-19, he didn't get as much time to test <laughs> as he needed to, basically. So. Yeah, I did have a, a, a small, uh, just like a quick test that I did where I loaded some configurations into an XML script that you could switch between. Um, but it was just like, ah, we've got other stuff to worry about. Let's do that later. So, <laughs> any other questions, comments? Okay. Well, thank you guys so much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you guys.